the uh, Mr. Litswalo spoke about the foreigner that got that huge settlement. Oh yeah, settlement. And the 500 million. Yeah, yes. um, which is also contentious because there were no lawyers involved. One of the very few things that we, I specifically insisted on because I was to spearhead the process of going to parliament and make sure that we get heard by parliament. I specifically said that I'd not want to represent a body or an association that seeks to fight on behalf of lawyers. Any victim that is not represented by a lawyer mm. in the RAF process is surely going to be undersettled. Okay. Uh, I, I, I won't agree or disagree. But the thing is, you don't even know that your claim is prescribed. You're sitting ah, at home mm. in Mami Lodi. You're just waiting. Uh, you're just waiting for the fund to respond to you. Ah, uh, and then, uh, you know, a few years down the line, you realize, oh, my claim is prescribed. Even if I secure a trial date today for 2029, let's say for the 24th of March, mm. I will only... The fund will only start working on that matter on the 22nd of March, 2029. King King David Studio Podcast. An episode that uh, I got a lot of uh, messages for. Uh, I got a message. Once I had uh, Colin Setsualo, a CEO of uh, and the Road Accident Fund, I got a lot of people, lawyers also, uh, who said he's lying. <laughs> we need to clarify <laughs> a lot of these things. And, and we need right of reply. And I said, all right, it's fine. <laughs> I'll do something about it. And that's yeah. why we have this particular episode. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. Well, uh, thanks, David, for, for hosting us. I'm going to make a mistake and call you Warra in the process. It's okay. No um, worries. It's not a mistake. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my name is Nwako Mutlalora. I'm the deputy chairman at APRAF. APRAF stands for the Association for the Protection of Road Accident Victims. We've been around since 2014. And uh, if you give me time, I'll explain why we've been around. And I'm with my brother, Gert, uh, who has also been around with us at APRAF since then, legal, uh, basically looking at the legal issues that at APRAF we need to, we had to deal with. David, I'm Gert Nell. <laughs> I'm the legal advisor to APRAF, or one of the legal advisors to APRAF, and I'm also the director of Gert Nell Incorporated, a firm of attorneys that um, primarily deal with the Road Accident Fund. I'm also a former employee of the Road Accident Fund, some... 25 odd years ago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're here today just to talk in general and um, have a good chat about the Road Accident Fund. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a, a, a subject that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, and also it was made popular by a TV show. Uh, I blew it, <laughs> where people yeah. get a lot of cash <laughs> and then they blow it in, in no time. I think it contributed to, to people knowing that, geez, there's a lot of money there. Yeah. But then those who, who are in the legal space, obviously, have always known uh, that there's uh, these processes that take place. Yeah. But I, I think it gets a bad name. Uh, and and we'll, we'll decode this world as, as we can. Why do you exist? Well, maybe you can help us with this. Why do you exist as an organization? Well, in... Since 2010, let me let me take it back there. Mm. The government wanted to to change the way the RA functions, okay. and they've been going to parliament and to see how they can do that, and uh, without success for that matter, for various reasons. Back in 2010, let me put it like that: the government tried to change how the RA functions mm -hmm. <clears throat> through a cabinet memo. And uh, they went to parliament to try and introduce something called REPS, the Road Accident Benefit Scheme. Okay. And uh, they were unsuccessful in doing that. And in 2014, they tried again. And various professionals, uh, your psychologists, your doctors, and of course, lawyers, came together and said, there's this thing that is coming. Uh, we don't agree with it and its intentions. Uh, but then how do we make government know that we don't agree with this, with this intention of government? <clears throat> so so I, I happen to be there to, to then navigate uh, the, the way around APRAF, mm -hmm. making sure that government is aware of what we then called unintended consequences of, of the reps. Mm -hmm. So what we did is that we said, no, 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 no. We made it deliberate decision that we're not a mouthpiece for lawyers. We want to assist road crash victims. Because what we realized is that the reps, if it were to be passed into law, it would disadvantage a lot of uh, road crash vic victims. Mm -hmm. And we we had a lot of research into that and we were able to prove our point. 
So what we did was that we made several trips to Parliament to go and engage Parliament uh, on, on various platforms. Attended all the portfolio committee meetings where they were discussing the, the reps. Attended all the public participations all over the country where they were talking about the reps to make our inputs known. Mm. And I believe we made a compelling and a very convincing case in the sense that uh, just towards the closing of the previous administration in Parliament in 2018, in December, then Parliament formally and officially rejected the reps, uh, something that we can take credit for. Uh, so that's why as reps we, we exist, mm. purely to protect the victims of road crashes. You know, something that stands out about this act, and in one of the portfolio committee presentations that you did as an organization, uh, you speak of this uh, Road Accident Act as a very special act. <laughs> What's so special about it? Maybe Art, you can help us with this. David, the thing is, the Road Accident Fund Act, as we know today, has been tried and tested th in various platforms I, and, you know, up to the apex court in our country on various aspects. And I think it's been reformed in such a way that it gives... It does exactly what it was intended to do, to give the widest possible protection to both the victim and the administrator of the fund. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, it's finally, it's, it's finally balanced to ensure that both the right accident fund and the victim's rights are protected. So it's been, uh, you know, through so many tests in terms of constitutionality, in terms of what what could be regarded as reasonable compensation mm. and you know what is to the benefit of the victims which victims should be included or excluded from the act and through the years it's been tempered into probably one of the finest pieces of legislation that you can find mm. and i'm sure we'll get to the, the, details, the details of that a bit is, later is, is is it unique uh, this act in relation to really what it's what it's it's meant to do and i ask this question because it looks like, when I understand it, you and I are driving on the road, we hit someone, or we get into an accident. Uh, and based on my understanding of the act, and correct me, we are not necessarily individually liable for compensation of the accident, but government, or all of us collectively as road users, are responsible for that. Am I understanding it correctly? You're understanding it correct, and that's exactly the reasoning behind the act, was to protect both the victim and the wrongdoer. Mm -hmm. The victim to the extent that you want to prevent him from having to claim from what we call a man of straw, in that if he goes to court or wants to make sure that he gets due compensation, he knows that the defendant would be capable, financially capable of addressing his um, requirements in mm -hmm. terms of compensation. And to that extent, the wrongdoer is always also protected because the right accident fund as it is today stands in the shoes of the wrongdoer. So yeah. in terms of the act, um, the Road Accident Fund basically takes on the liability. It's still a fault-based system, so it's adversarial. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why attorneys are crucial to the process of engaging the Road Accident Fund and to ensure that the victim's rights are protected. But um, that's another subject that we'll, we'll get Absolutely. to as well. But again, the balance is there. Mm -hmm. between the administrator and of the fund and the victims themselves. It's, it's how, you, at, how you deal with the process as, as it progresses in, on a time frame, how um, obviously effective it is or isn't. And, and I'm sure we'll get to that as well. Absolutely, we have to because that's the real reason why the, the, the conversation has become so contentious because of... Uh, uh, what the CEO of <laughs> a road accident fund yeah. has been introducing. And, yeah. and, and I, I've noticed a, a number of uh, newspaper reports where uh, even mud slinging and, and, and between <laughs> yourselves and, and the road accident fund. But we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, something happened in 1992 with regards to this act. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Um, that stands out in the act. Was there a change? In the 98. Uh, okay, maybe one that you Actually, remember. 2008. 2008, okay. yes. Um, Recently, there yeah. was, uh, the, the, those were the last effective changes that were made for a specific reason 
the uh, Mr. Litswalo spoke about the foreigner that got that huge oh, yeah, settlement. Oh, yeah, 500 million. Yeah, yes. um, which is also contentious because there were no lawyers involved. If there was, Whoa. the settlement would have probably been uh, much less. <laughs> wow. But, uh, you know, there's all sorts of stories. You know, it's almost an urban legend, that settlement. But yeah, but it, know, we know it happened. It, it happened. Yeah. And as a result of that, the act was changed to cap foreigners' claims. So I hear, you know, the uh, Mr. Litswali talking about foreigners, you know, being a financial liability to the fund. That's been addressed in the amendments of the 2000. Let's talk about it. Let's go straight to it. What is, what is, his issues are clear. We understand what he's saying. But what is, what is the reality? The reality is foreigner claims make up 3% of the fund's financial liability. So mm. that is a small, minute speck in the bigger scheme of things. And, um, you know, the, the impression is that the fund is focusing on uh, these small issues with the view of saving costs to some extent and obviously trying to do the right thing by paying what is due. But again, if, you know, the bottom line in terms of the approach to foreigners are if you don't like or if you, or if you don't intend to pay them, you can't change the policy by bringing out a, 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 a directive or anything to the extent you have to change the act because mm. the act is uh, a creature, the right accident fund is a creature of statute, meaning that anything anybody within the four walls of the right accident fund does has to be in terms of the act. So if you don't like the act, you have to change it. So if there are certain um, people that, that are included in the act in mm. terms of compensation like foreigners, and you don't like that, then obviously there's a process that you need to follow to do it the right way. And it ends up in Parliament. Exactly. You have to start the act. Yes. But now the impression that we get is that the fund is trying to change legislation through litigation. Mm. And you can't do that. And unfortunately, each time the fund tries to do that, they send home with their tails between their legs and they don't understand why because they're doing, trying to do the right thing. But again, if the right process is followed, I mean, as Nwaka has indicated, we've been involved with politics and the changing of laws since 2010. We all know it's not an easy process. Mm -hmm. and you, but you can't circumvent that by trying to bring out, um, you know, uh, regulations that are uh, in conflict with the Act itself. Mm -hmm. And that's, hence we're sitting with this issue regarding um, uh, foreigners or people coming into the country that don't have permits or... Uh, you know, IDs or, or whatever the requirements are in terms of the funds' view. But the Act is what it is. There's been a lot of judgments um, deciding on the matter, all against the Right Accident Fund. It seems as if they're appealing yet another one. And they're probably going to be shot down again because you can't change what is written there. It's cast in stone. If you mm -hmm. want to change the stone, you have to, to be able to do the... the mm -hmm. um, the hard work and, and, and go through the process of, you know, tempering the act to what you want it to be through due diligence and process. You know, something that, that stands out about the inquiries we've been getting here in this office about the right of reply yeah. is the, the attack that seems to be leveled uh, by uh, the CEO of Road Excellent Funds to the legal fraternity as a whole. That seems to be the issue. So I want to take a few boxes before we get to, to, to the real meat. How are you guys funded? I, the reason I ask that is so we remove the biases, possible biases that, that may be interpreted. We actually work on a very shoestring budget mm. and uh, we work on donations. Um, the donations will come from your medical legal fraternity, will come from your medical experts mm. and other professionals as well. Um, are, you not being, are you not seen as representing them based on, on their funding? One of the one of the very few things that we I specifically insisted on because I was to spearhead the process of going to parliament and make sure that we get heard by parliament. I specifically said that I'd not want to represent a body or an association that seeks to fight on behalf of lawyers. Mm -hmm. And all, all of us agreed that this is the right approach. And you can check all our all the work we have been doing. Uh, it has always been for the victim. Uh had never have been about lawyers. We mm. actually made sure that uh, we need to speak for the victim. But let's be honest, Dave. Uh, the any victim that is not represented by a lawyer mm. in the RAF process 
is surely going to be undersettled. Okay. Uh, that, I, I won't agree or disagree. Let's let's yeah. keep talking about it. So that's that's the bottom line, and uh, uh, it has been stated, it has been proven. Mm. Uh, the RAF has been soliciting claims directly from from the victims, and then they allowed claims for the for the victims to prescribe in their hands about nine thousand of them, and that is now some nine thousand people sitting at home, waiting for the RAF to respond to their to their claims. But then they prescribe because. They just simply overwhelmed with the amount of work that is there, mm. and then the CEO, I think, is the previous CEO, then had to, uh, you know, interdict himself. Uh, I'm not too sure if I'm using the right way mm. to, to try and say, okay, we've got the claims that I've prescribed in our hands. Uh, we've got to try and rescue the situation because they simply can't cope with the work. Mm. And anybody who is being, who went, who goes to the RF unrepresented. Uh, Someone like you, Dave, uh, you're not a you're not a layman. The RAF process is too cumbersome for you. You definitely won't be able to claim on your own. I personally won't do it myself. So people sitting in the villages where I come from won't be able to help themselves without the help of a lawyer. Uh, and we know this because we have been to every single corner of this country trying to speak to the public about the changes that government was proposing back then. We know the difficulties that are happening there. Uh, if if someone you know, someone from where I come from, uh, who is two hundred kilometers to the nearest town where you could find the the nearest RAF offices, if someone get in gets injured there, for an example, you know, my mother and my father who are still there, if they get injured, without a lawyer helping them, they are unlike they are likely going to be. To, you know, to be to be seen with that claim prescribing. Mm. These things are happening on a regular basis. We come across these things until this day. It's happening even in your in your in your townships where people could easily go to town quickly uh, uh, using a public transport that is available. People are still having claims that prescribe because they've got no information. Let's explain some of the words. What does prescribe mean in this context? In layman's times, it will be, uh, I'm trying to think what to prescribe. It will be to expire. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, it, it expires. You, 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 you got involved in an accident today. Yeah. And there's a, there's a time frame. You've got three years to claim. Exactly. Uh, for someone like you, mm. if you're a minor child and hurt, you must help me here uh, to, so that I don't make the, I don't, I don't give Dave the wrong information. If you're a child, you've got until tw- you're 21. Uh, okay. Then, mm-hmm. then you can still claim, make your claim. But if you are an adult to get injured today, you've got a window period of three years in which to put your claim. If you mm-hmm. don't, regardless of the seriousness of your injury, uh, you can't claim at the RAF. Okay. And believe you me, uh, we go to we go to municipalities. We engage with ward committees. We go to we still do it until this day. Mm-hmm. We come across people that have that have got their relatives badly injured. And because they, they didn't get the information that we're giving them, they couldn't claim. So they, the claim so, prescribes. So it, yeah, they ran out of time. Yes, yeah. because because of because they lack information, because the funds simply can't get to all of these people, unfortunately. What is the the, the constitutional right of a, of a, a crash victim in this context? Very basic. Uh, what what rights do I have once an accident has happened, based on, on what a uh, Road Accident Fund Act says? Well... Obviously, there are certain statutory requirements that you need to comply with. I just, for the uh, sake of the viewers, want to confirm that there's an exception to the three years in matters that we call hit and run matters. So they are, if the identity of the driver of the vehicle, the person that caused the accident isn't known, then the uh, prescription period differs. You know, it, it, uh, Is it long or short? It reduces to two years. So Ooh. that's just something that, that you should be mindful of. But in terms of being involved in an accident, um, you know, again, that that's the first challenge for that person is obviously to gain the knowledge of what you can do. And that, I think, is what Norco is, has been addressing is there's a lack of information in, in especially your rural areas that people don't have access to either a lawyer or the right accident fund for that matter. Mm-hmm. But if, if you are... Um, uh, in a position that you can uh, engage somebody, they will guide you 
obviously to, to compile the necessary forms in order to comply with the requirements of the Act. So it's not simply just completing a few forms or, or filling forms. As, as it's, the, uh, the, the CEO says. <laughs> there's, there's actually a process, due diligence that you have to comply with. And obviously because fault is still a requirement, you need to convince the right accident fund that the accident wasn't solely because of your mm. um, um, negligence. negligence. Yeah. Uh, somebody else was at fault. And then obviously you also got the duty to prove to what extent you were injured and how it's going to influence you in the future. Let's establish this one small detail. Based on what I've been reading about what Collins is saying and what, uh, what you guys are saying, there's a lot of similarity. You don't differ quite a lot with Collins, yeah. with, with, Collins with, with road accident. Am I correct in saying that? Well, you, you, got... you sound like you tell the same story with very minor differences. I, I think if I may <laughs> come in there... Yeah. Um, I think the main um, difference that we've got is obviously Mr. Litswalu doesn't want attorneys to be part of the process. Okay. And, and I can understand that because obviously there, it, there is a history there. But if you look back practically at the system and the process, if you put yourself in a position that you take your most prized possession, let's say your motor car, and... Um, you uh, you know it's a it's a brand vehicle like a BMW, a Mercedes, or a Ferrari, whatever. Are you going to take it to a backyard mechanic, or are you going to take it to the guy that you know you don't go, you're not going to have a comeback? You're gonna you you've got uh, guarantees or the in terms of and yeah, <laughs> mm. or are you going to take it or are you going to try and fix the car yourself? Yeah. So you've got that option in terms of if we have to relate that to the Right Accident Fund Act. So nine times out of ten, and I'm sure Mr. Letzwala will agree that if a family member or friend is involved in an accident, you would advise him to go and see a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Simply because, as Noaku has indicated, the Right Accident Fund, with all due respect, doesn't have the capacity to deal with direct claims. And in actual fact, they made a policy decision to stop taking on new instructions. And, um, I mean, the um, comparing apples with apples, if we're saying, listen, go directly to the Right Accident Fund, you might be faced with having uh, to be in a position that the road accident fund just doesn't have the capacity to deal with your matter and then the matter prescribes in the hands and then there's all sorts of problems. And ironically enough, the only people that can breathe life into those claims are lawyers. Is, is it I the issue of capacity only or, or, or process? And I ask this because it, it's possible that uh, a road accident fund can hire 20,000 more people yeah. and try to solve this. Is it a capacity issue only? I think at this point it is, but the thing is, the in reality, why does the fund want to take on the additional burden and to become top heavy, taking on matters? In my experience, what the Road Accident Fund has done during the time of the benefit scheme, uh, what they've done is they they've given it a trial run because in terms of the benefit scheme, the lawyers were supposed to be asked out of the system, and the fund had all sorts of initiatives saying, "Listen, come to us directly," and that's mm -hmm. how they surmounted thousands of claims onto themselves, claims that shouldn't have been in the system. Yeah. And bringing it back to the argument is, yes, get lawyers involved because they will filter the matters that are um, uh, capable of being, uh, uh, there's a reasonable prospect of success of, of claiming against the right accident fund. So lawyers, to some extent, are the gatekeepers of claims between the public and the right accident fund. So do, they do a lot of work, essentially, the... the um, donkey work to prepare these claims mm. and to get them so substantially compliant for a victim to have the opportunity to lodge a claim. If we look at, uh, you know, financial terms to do a simple RAF claim from taking the instruction to finalizing the matter, costs any lawyer that deals with that matter, anything between 150 and 250,000 Rand out of his pocket if he's working on contingency, not taking a deposit from the client because nine times out of 10, the victims don't have the money to yeah. finance their own claims. So lawyers basically take on that financial burden. They carry those matters for these days up to seven years to finance those claims. And then obviously um, due diligence is paid and there's um, a judicial oversight on, on accounts and whatnot that we will probably discuss as well. There's this uh, key word contingency fees, but we'll get to that. But the fact of the matter is, any which way you want to argue getting lawyers out of the system, and it's even part of this new proposed road accident fund amendment bill that's going to parliament soon, is one of the primary objectives of that bill is to 
exclude lawyers from the system. So my question is, as you rightfully said, how many people are you going to employ to do what the lawyers are doing now? To do the donkey work, to compile the claims, to give it to you on a, on a silver platter mm-hmm. so that you can decide whether or not you're going to assist this person or not. I want to avoid uh, uh, the possibility of quoting uh, the CEO of Road Accident Fund yeah. uh, incorrectly. So the way I'm going to do this, in terms of the, some of the stuff that he said, I will just play a video and then we react to it. Okay, yeah. fine. Like, I, I think that's it the best way to do it. The RAF has, has finally found itself in a place where it can fight for itself against an onslaught of lawyers that have been pillaging, if, if that's true, yeah. uh, from the RAF. Absolutely. You ask any South African, they will tell you they know a lawyer that is very rich from actually filling forms. Mm. I mean, uh, what, what do rough lawyers do, in fact? And, and the, the difficulty with it, David, is if you think about it, all they do is fill forms. Mm. And after filling forms, they then uh, make money from that. Mm. Uh, it is the only social benefit scheme that works on delict, meaning you are suing someone to get something that you are entitled to. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you had to do that at Sasa. And say, everyone who wants to have a child <laughs> support grant, please sue us. Mm. And that's exactly what is happening here. So, yeah. so we are saying, you don't have to sue the state to get that money. That money is entitled, it's yours. Mm. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, look, I, let me <laughs> take the first bite. You can respond to that. I... I would want us to respond to something that I'll view as a personal attack uh, to to the profession. Um, uh, because to simply say people are making money just by filling forms is not true. There is a lot of work uh, that is being done. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and her can speak to it, the lawyers are doing a lot of work to, to assist him. Um, um, and to equate... Uh, you know, the claims for road crash victims to Osasa is, 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 is not correct. It's not right because uh, old age grant is because you're old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and no two accidents are the same. Uh, your accident, your, 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 if you get injured in a, in a, in a motor crash, uh, and I get injured as well, these two injuries are not the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you can equate that to to social grants. And old age is the same for Yeah, I mean, if, if you're old and and <laughs> in terms of the law, uh, you've got to be given old age grant and that's just it. Uh, if you're a child, you're born in South Africa and your parents are any, you know, between the particular bracket, either qualify or you don't. You don't need a lawyer for that. But then, in terms of the current legislation, the law that he is meant to implement, uh, uh, it's a law of delict, as he is saying. Uh, a, a layman, my father cannot be able to help himself. Uh, you know, David, as I said before, you can't lodge a claim yourself successfully unless you're being assisted. David, yes. Uh, interesting on, on that note is you would expect if the road accident fund or the department had a issue with the delict uh, component of RAF work, you would have uh, expected them to exclude that in terms of the amended RAF bill that is currently going to Parliament, and it's not. So yeah. the adversarial process is still, even in the proposed new amendment, is still there. So to argue that lawyers uh, aren't required or won't be required in the future, as the has indicated, is the same as SASA, it's even in the in the new ball, it, it will never work because you will have a, a person that was injured in an accident that would have to prove to what extent he was injured. And the simple reason why apportionment or delict is still applied is to address the financial liability of the road accident fund. Obviously, if a person was 90% to blame, his claim is reduced by 90 or 50 or 30%. The person, which, we, meaning the one who's, uh, the who's, pers- claiming, who's, from, claim, who's, who's claiming, claiming from, from the road accident yeah. fund. So fault was built into the system One for one, one of the reasons was to reduce the liability of the fund. Mm. This was tested when we argued against the road accident benefit scheme bill because in terms of that bill, fault would have been excluded. Yeah. And there was a huge uproar because that would have meant that people could have 
being as drunk as a fly, mm-hmm. cause an accident, you couldn't do anything. He would be able there will to still claim. Be claiming, yes. Yeah. He would sit in jail and he would still be able to claim. So that is there's a reason why in that sense I'm saying everything in the act, it's like a BMW. Anything, any light, any switch in that is there for a reason. Mm-hmm. It's been tested, it's been tried. It's a wonderful piece of legislation. And again, if you've got a problem with lawyers and uh, but you still intend to keep fault as a basis for for liability then you can expect that lawyers will always be part of the system they will have to be they will have because to prove clearly an element with, of it clearly yeah. with a track record of the fund taking on matters themselves how are they going to deal with the delict part of that so we need to be um you know reasonable in terms of what the expectations are you can't have your cake and eat it as well you're going to have to decide listen at some point we either need to work together to a common purpose to save the fund or we're going to keep on fighting about things that aren't really such a big issue Mm -hmm. because fault is there it's probably it's definitely still going to be there Mm -hmm. in in the new dispensation if it is ever enacted so um the fund can can argue, or Mr. Litzwala, as much as he wants to, lawyers will always be part of the system. Let's go to the next one. In terms of Section 19C, mm. uh, let me read it for you. I see you. You, you came rage. I came rage. Because <laughs> so I, I want to read. Yeah. I want to read this 19C for you. Because people will say, no, uh, you know, this Litzwala guy is a problem. It says liabilities excluded in certain cases, meaning the RAF would not pay. It says um, the fund or an agent shall not be obliged to compensate any person in terms of Section 17 for any loss or damage. C says if the claimant, the claim consent mm. has not been instituted and prosecuted by the third party, okay. you directly, y- yes. or be on behalf of the third party by, listen to this okay. first one, yeah. Roman figure one, any person entitled to practice as an attorney within the Republic. That's a lawyer, that's standard, yeah. Or, Roman figure two, any person who is in the service or who is a representative of the state or government or a provincial, territorial, or local authority. Who's that? Help me understand. Who's that? No one. No one like that? No, there's no one like this in South Africa. Who is this? Let, let's let's go back to it. Let's let's hear it again. Any you know the first one is a lawyer. Yeah. Who is in the service uh. or who is a representative of the state mm-hmm. or government or a provincial, territorial or local authority? So you're saying who such a creature doesn't Does exist. Does not exist. Doesn't even say rough employee. Huh. What is your interpretation of what he's talking about? Um, surely the Road Accident Fund is a government institution. Mm. So the implication of that section of the Act is that you've got an option as a claimant to claim to lodge a claim of the fund yourself mm-hmm. in your own capacity, or you can engage a lawyer, or you can have somebody assist you, either a representative of the Road Accident Fund. In my time at the Road Accident Fund, when I was a claims handler, we dealt with many matters where people lodged their own claims, but there we didn't step into the shoes of the lawyer. The person lodged his claim and we might have given them guidance in terms of what what would be regarded as a reasonable amount to claim or whatnot. Mm. So, you know, that that for me is a non-issue. I mean, it's very clear the, and I think the the, um, general accepted approach to claim lodgement is either you do it yourself or you engage a lawyer. There's no... There's really no, not a third option, yeah? mm-hmm. but the, the Act made provision for that for the simple reason, if we take into account the Act is written in such a way to give the widest possible protection to the victims. So it gives you that option to decide. So if you've got the fund took it one step further when they, uh, uh, in the time of the benefit scheme, mm-hmm. to step into the shoes of the lawyer, basically taking on that liability part and you would find that afterwards, many of those claims that might have prescribed or that were undersettled, the lawyers were able to claim for contractual, uh, 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 on a contractual basis, basis rather than a delictual basis for mm-hmm. damages because the fund actually took it upon themselves to do the claims on a formal basis. You can informally still advise this person, which that 
this particular section makes provision for. What I don't understand, uh, and maybe uh, well, you can help me decode this, what is the real issue if the claim and the act allows for people to to do it themselves? Yeah. What is at the heart of, of um, the outcry that says, but you need lawyers? If indeed I can, is it only that you feel I'm not well informed or they don't have enough resources to handle this. And based on the example you just made now, you yeah. said, while you were there, you could say to this person, this is how you should do it. Why is it that we can't do the same now? Well, well let me give a simple example with the, uh, I think last year or so, the, we've been hearing a lot of stories about um, recipients of Sasa in the Western Cape queuing for days and weeks mm. because they couldn't get their money. So government was not able to process their monies. And that is something that, uh, by the way, they're doing on a monthly basis. They know uh, David's uncle, who is receiving a Sasa grant on this particular day, must get this particular amount. We must just process it. I don't know if they're doing it electronically or through cash, but it's, it's, it's a specific amount to a specific person on a particular date. Mm. Now, the as I've said before, it's there in the in the in the RAF uh, uh, one of the the documents that they prepared uh, for their exco. A total of nine thousand claims have prescribed mm. in the hands of the fund. Pause one second. If a claim prescribes at the hands of the of of the fund, yeah, shouldn't you as a as a claimant? Uh, lodge against that because clearly there's some something wrong happened to you but the thing is you don't even know that your claim is prescribed you're sitting ah, at home mm. in mommy Lodi. you're just waiting are uh, you just waiting for the fund to respond to you ah. uh, and then uh, you know a few years down the line you realize oh my claim is prescribed mm. and uh, and the ceo then the then ceo of the raf had to use the ceo lawyers to sue himself mm. to interrupt prescription which was illegal because uh no, no CEO is allowed to do that to interrupt prescription. What do you need? The courts to do that. Mm. Now, our problem is that the, the victims don't know. Mm. Uh, At the heart of it. Yes, the victims don't know that the, that claims have prescribed because the fund has not communicated that information to them. He spoke okay. about... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, David, just to uh, address your the specific question on why isn't the road accident fund capacitated to address this... You can still, and obviously it's a decision that the Road Accident Fund must make whether or not they want to assist people to that extent. But in in simple terms, in legal terms, you've only got one opportunity to do this claim. Mm -hmm. So if this is a situation in which you have to negotiate your final paycheck, wouldn't you rather have somebody that is a seasoned personal injury lawyer address your claim by not just filling forms, but compiling uh, medical legal reports, interpreting those reports, having them actuarially assessed, getting to a figure that you can propose to the Road Accident Fund and say, listen, we think this is due compensation mm -hmm. for our client because the practitioner takes the risk that should he not negotiate the best possible settlement, he would be liable for under settlement. So the victim has the protection and the, the peace of mind that if my, this lawyer will do everything he can in order to ensure that once I receive my settlement, I will be financially viable again and I would be able to address my concerns and possibly maybe uh, achieve the same type of, of quality of life that I've had before mm -hmm. having regard to my injury. So what we found, again, in my experience was people, in those days, you could have claimed for what we call uh, whiplash injuries. Mm, so wow. people used to claim whiplash injuries by the bucket load. Mm. Now that you can do on your own. I mean, there's no, it, it's not, it doesn't take mental gymnastics mm -mm. to do a claim like that. But once it gets to a, a point that a child is, is mauled underneath a vehicle and there's an impact on, you know, the way that she looks, the way that she's going to present herself, the fact that she's emotionally damaged physically damaged she might not be able to to be children naturally she might not be able to to gain um, um, 
proper employment. Once it gets to something as technical as that, you would like to have, you would prefer to have somebody that can deal with that, assess the matter properly and make sure that he does what he needs to. Otherwise, his neck is going to be on the block. Never mind the road accident fund. Mm -hmm. So that's where the value of lawyers come come in. And the, in 2008, these small whiplash claims were basically made history with the Im implementation of what we call a serious injury assessment report, um, in short, an RA4 report, which had to be at least 30% all person impaired to be able to to uh, um, uh, claim general damages. Now, 30%, you're talking about a person that's eating his food through a straw. Mm. It's seriously injured people. And we found, again, that's the value of lawyers, that if somebody comes to you for advice, you can tell them, sir, there's no reasonable prospects of success. You're not going to be able to claim general damages. You're already on a pension. There's no loss of earnings. There's no medical expenses because you were treated at uh, Steve Biko. Yeah. So, sorry, we can't help you. So many claims were excluded because of those changes that were implemented in the 2008 amendment. Mm -hmm. So, exactly the same with the current act. Obviously, the act needs to change as conditions change and... Um, you know, more cars are on the road and more accidents happen, then obviously there are certain things that need to be built into this act because the act needs to be able to sustain itself. That entity, that organism that's the right accident fund needs to protect itself. And the way that it does it is through the act. So, and the way that the right accident fund needs to do it is by implementing the act because all the protection, all your remedies are built into the act. You just need to, to make use of them. They're all there. <clears throat> Let's, let's, let's listen to another one of... Where the third party has entered into an agreement... Let me make sure I'm playing. Yes. Where the third party has entered into an agreement with any person, either than the, the one referred to in paragraph C, the first one I... Yes. Which is say Roman figure one, which is the lawyer, and this other person we don't know, mm -hmm. in accordance with which the third party has undertaken to pay such person after the settlement of the claim, a portion of the compensation in respect of the claim mm. or any amount in respect of the investigation or service rendered in respect of the handling of the claim otherwise than on instructions from the person contemplated in paragraph C, uh, Roman figure one and Roman figure two. Mm -hmm. So what are they saying? They say, if you enter into a contract with anyone except us. Us meaning? Lawyers. Yes. Then the RAF must not honor. They must not pay. <laughs> you found this like this. It is like this. It's there. It's the act. It is here. Um, David, David if I remember correctly, that point that Mr. Litzwalid took was on the argument on medical aids. Mm. Uh, he might have mentioned that a bit later as well. If you, and again, you have to read things in context. Um, that particular section of the act addresses who can and who cannot assist victims. And again, we must have regard to the fact that everything in the act is there to protect the victim and the fund mm -hmm. by the same token. So that particular paragraph in the act is to prevent um, people from being exploited by people from the street claiming to be paralegals or whatnot, okay. to represent them, to engage them and say, listen, I'll do this claim for you. I know how to do it. We, there's a lot of people out there that knows a lot about RAF work. Because but they, they're not lawyers. But they're not lawyers. Yeah. So or that's they're it. not allowed to, to be mm. lawyers, to yeah. practice as lawyers. Mm. So what they do, that section is built in to protect the victim from exploitation so that they discourage to engage people, third parties from, it's not there because lawyers wanted all the work. That person can still go to mm. the right accident fund them, so, or the fund it's, or, or to the lawyer it's just to prevent them from being exploited. So it's actually, you know, as I say, it's to the benefit of the victim. Let me see if, because uh, I see it's part two of that. Oh, how many mm. years now since the immemorial? So we're talking. It's fine. It's the same point. Mm. Okay. I'm curious to know the process by which we analyze the process by which the money ends up in your account as RAF mm -hmm. through SARS. This one, yeah, these insurance companies, how does it end up in their account? Is it's that, it's me like buying yours. a taxi. Yeah, and you paying every month like you are paying for but your who, who am I car paying? to be crushed. The insurer. The insurer. Mm -hmm. And it's a requirement. It's a requirement. You know? by, by law. By law. By the South African yes. law that says that I says have to have this. You, have, you must have it. 
you, you know that there's another one called public liability insurance. And who, who does that one cover? I don't know who has ever been paid by public liability. Who who is it? Who has to pay for it every month? You, I'm sure you are paying for it in your insurance for a car. If you go and look at somewhere, you'd see public liability. So the minute I buy a car and I get an insurance, you get insurance. There must be there is Sasria in there. Yeah, Sasria is, is, is for there is yeah. public liability. Go and check it. Actually, millions. You might find that yours is twenty million or whatever. Mine is about fifteen or something like that. My goodness. No one ever pays that. Do you want to comment on that? First and foremost, a victim in the Road Accident Fund Act makes provision for a passenger driver to claim from the Road Accident Fund. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the same argument. If you want to change it or if you want to hold the insured private insurance companies liable, then surely you need to make certain changes to accommodate that. I've heard Mr. Litswalu arguing this point. I've not seen anything formal to the extent, and I suspect it's because, like any other matter, that um, that the fund endeavors on spending, um, you know, money on. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, mm. except if provision is made uh, either through the act itself. And again, I haven't seen uh, in terms of the current proposed amendment bill. There has been made provision for that. Mm. So I suspect this is. Uh, um, Storm in a teacup as far as the current system is concerned. There might be an argument. It sounds like a good argument, but as it is, nobody has exploited it yet. The fund hasn't made anything formal about it yet. I think the cost involved are just going to be too much. And uh, seeing that they've made provision in the amendment for that, I suspect that that would be the quickest and, and most cost-effective way to deal with it if it's accepted. Obviously, it has to stand the test of time. If it's tempered in Parliament, it's going to be interesting to see whether that uh, argument stands. There's a, a point that comes across quite a bit when we speak of road accident fund. It's, it's something that is discussed in this conversation as well about corruption in, in the sector. That yeah. is from whatever angle it comes from, whether it's from, from lawyers, and I'll use that really as a reference, or from people who know more about the system and they know how to how to overcome it, how to how to rob it, how to cheat yeah. it. How rife is that based on your observation? In in terms of the uh we can go check with the LPC as well. The percentage of lawyers that have been uh, reported and found guilty for for fraud, it's about two percent of the entire uh, legal profession. And uh I know he said that the, the LPC is a, is a club for gentlemen and ladies, uh, but the truth of the matter is that the LPC is there to regulate the profession. Mm. And uh, uh, just like the RAF, they may be, there may be some inefficiencies because they are overwhelmed with the amount of work that is there. And uh, I worry again that uh, uh, that comment by him, you know, from my perspective, was seen as a personal attack to... Uh, to the noblemen that are there, which is something that I want to to dwell on to, onto a lot. Uh, but the LPC is there to regulate uh, the mm -hmm. profession, and uh, they do disbar people. Uh, the reason that the fact that we can't hear uh, how many lawyers have been disbarred is because uh, you know they are they are careful not to not to rob people. But yes, indeed, they're there. There are lawyer there are lawyers that. Uh, are dishonest uh, to the many people that are there. And uh, as our we have been saying, if anybody has been, feels that they've been hard done by any lawyer, uh, we are there to provide information what can be done to resolve that situation. Mm. Yeah. David, I can just maybe add on to that and I must commend Mr. Letswala because I know that he's made quite an effort to clean up the fund. And uh, I know there was a discussion on NUM and mm. their members. and NUMSA, here, actually. Uh, yeah, NUMSA. Yeah. And uh, he rightfully addressed the issue that he got rid of the bad apples, mm -hmm. which, you know, you can expect in any institution that works with this amount of money and, and basics that there will be corruption, you know, in and outside. So, and I know one of his priorities was to clean up shop, and I think that he managed to do that to a large extent. So, listen to the next I'm one. I'm curious to know the process by which we analyze the process. With majority that. of judges in the judiciary mm -hmm. are former RAF plaintiff attorneys. I remember this. So meaning that they were once in a panel. 
so no, to speak. No. Forget the panel is the defense panel. There are others that oh, come from there. Or the claimants yes. panel, so to speak. Yes. How do you know that? Uh, now, they... now, no, but they, they are all there. You can ask them. Any, uh, some of them are judge presidents. <laughs> 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 well, I guess it goes back to the point I just made re now, now, most recently about, the, you know, the corruption. That yeah. It's a boys club that's the protecting itself. Boys and ladies club. But, but still, David, I think and I see one of the main objectives of the fund and ethos is respect. Mm. And I think we must still, despite what happens in court, we must still respect uh, the court system and the courts. The judges are there for a reason. And you know, the fact that you don't win all of your matters doesn't mean necessarily mean that a judge is not um, objective in the matter. So I think um, it is a bit harsh and I think um, um, to some extent uncalled for. Um, you know, any litigant can't win all of his matters and the fact that you don't win doesn't necessarily mean that that judge is biased um, if if you have regard to the facts of the matter, which you should, and you can accept that the judges apply their minds to those, because obviously they've run the risk of uh, being taken on appeal, and having to to explain what they've done, and we've seen that of late that it does happen, and there there was an inst uh, you know a situation where a judge was was called on on a judgment that was made, and um, but I think we sh should still maintain the respect for the courts. They are there for a reason, and, mm. and I think we should subject ourselves to that. Whether or not the decision goes in our favor or not, uh, we come back to, to fight another day. That's well, how, well the, that's other point is, yeah. the other point is that judges are appointed through a judicial service commission. It's a process that is being run by, by parliament. Parliamentarians sit in the process of interviewing judges and then come up with who they think is the best for the job. Um, mm. But like I said before, again, a personal attack. Mm. Yeah, Let's listen to another one. When we started, one of the issues was to deal with the issue of what we call administrative costs. Mm. Lawyers are taking, at least from our numbers, mm. before they even pay the 25% to whoever, they are taking 10.6 billion or 40 billion, which is a quarter. What? Every year. Yeah. So you're saying before the 25%, there's already a 25%. There's already a 25% they're getting from RAF, which is legal costs associated with running this thing. And we are saying, this does not make sense. Which lawyers are these? The ones that are defending you or that are Both. claiming? Okay. Both. Okay. Okay. What does that mean? David, I think there's a common misinterpretation of of, of legal costs and legal fees. Okay. Um, you know, the fact, I think that there are so many RAF matters uh, which is created by the amount of accidents that we as South Africans are having to deal with on a daily basis. I think the fact that uh, personal injury lawyers are uh, much more involved in that system obviously highlights the way that they conduct the administration of their claims. And... Um, the fact of the matter is nine out of 10 claimants doesn't have the capacity to pay up front, give a deposit of 250,000 rand to finance his claim. I think it's claim. 10 out of 10 more. So, <laughs> so the fact of the matter is that, you know, the, the whole idea behind the Contingency Fee Act was, and it's, it's a very apt description, or, is that it, it's the, the layman's or the poor man's keys to the court. And mm. it's exactly what it is. These lawyers... Um, whatever you think of them, allow these people the opportunity to take their matters to court and to have a decision made on whether or not they should get that compensation that they're applying for. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, we're saving the fund a lot of initial uh, um, costs in terms of financing these matters on, on our own risk mm -hmm. because there is an inherent risk that um, something might go wrong and, uh, um, you know, the financing that you've done for the client might go astray. So, but the fact of the matter is, you know, to, to make such a comment and say that lawyers, uh, I don't know where 
Mr. Litswali gets to the 25% upfront because you can only charge that in terms of contingency once you've successfully completed the matter. And then I think for the viewers, it's very important to realize that the 25% is not a fee. Mm. It's a cap. So a law, any lawyer working on contingency still needs to show that he's done the work to get to that point that he can charge up to that percentage of a claim. It's not necessarily to say that it, that is what he's going to get. So it's a cap. It's not a fee. And the work still needs to be done. And I'm sure that maybe some, there might be a, a, a question on this matter later on where there's been an indication by Mr. Letswalu that attorneys are prolonging the process to make up um, that fee. It's my next point because he's taking, my videos are taking too long to, yeah. to get to that point. Let me play the next one. It could be that one, actually. The most inhumane piece of legislation I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. The liability of the fund. So it says liability limited in certain cases. Okay. Then it says, 18.4 says the liability of the fund or an agent to compensate a third party for any loss or damage contemplating section 17, which is as a result of a death of any person shall in respect of funeral expenses mm -hmm. be limited to the, natural, the necessary actual costs to cremate the deceased or inter him or her in a grave. These are not funeral costs. No, these are these are costs of mutual. Yeah, to put to actually not even mutual. These are at the graveside. That's it. It's probably hundred rand. There, there, there it is. Now, someone comes to Raf and says, "Guys, I can't bury my father. I don't Can have you money. help me up front." We say, but eighteen four says we can't. It must be the actual expense, actual cost. Sure, the actual cost of. Putting this person in the ground. Entering you into a grave. Yeah. Or the Limited cost of, to of, that. of cremation. Limited to that. It's this act. And now when you arrive at the road exit and fund, you are thinking these guys are heartless and all that. This is a heartless act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I, would, I would suggest that he speaks to the DG of the Department of Transport to prepare cabinet memo. Presented to Parliament to change the act. Uh, because it's heartless. Because it's heartless in his view. But the bottom line is that it's actually saving him money mm. that he could be, you know, paying for other things that he needs to pay for. Uh, uh, you know, remember Collins is the CEO of the RAF. He's not some junior official there. Mm -mm. Uh, so a comment like that coming from him is really uh, uh, insensitive. Yeah, David. And again, the... Um, in your main aspect of the act hasn't been addressed in the amendment or proposed amendment bill. That section is left as it is. So if the fund or Mr. Litswalu had uh, a problem with that particular section, surely they had the opportunity to change it now to say, listen, we'll pay whatever you mm -hmm. require in terms of funeral. And obviously they made, they came to the conclusion that is, as Nwaka has indicated, it's again for the financial viability of the road accident fund. It's to make sure that certain reasonable costs are paid. And it's it's all through the system, be it for the personal claim itself or funeral expenses. The golden thread is all, always the reasonableness of the mm. expense. And that's exactly what this is about. Let's talk about prolonging. Uh, Mr. Otsualo made it clear, and I'm sure you saw it, where he speaks yeah. about what, when we get it, we'll, we'll play it. We'll play it in this very section. Yeah. Where he speaks about lawyers deliberately prolong the process because the longer it takes uh, for the claim to be completed, the more money lawyers are able to make. Um, he says if they handle it directly, they can do it in three months or whatever. Uh, obviously, you can argue against that in terms of their capacity. But he says lawyers will string, string you along so, so they can claim. They can make more money from it. Please help us understand this. This, this is a bit of an explanation, but uh, hold on, David. This is the reality of road accident fund work is you engage a lawyer to do a claim for you. A lawyer prepares the claim, takes him about three to six months, depending on who the um, institution is. You need to gain the in information from you lodge your claim with the road accident fund. In terms of the road accident fund act, the fund has 60 days in which to consider the claim and obviously object to the validity of the claim if there's anything that doesn't substantially comply. Now, in terms of the act, the only thing that you need to lodge to have a viable claim is your RAF1 form and the medical part thereof. Mm -hmm. Anything in addition thereto is a luxury for the fund.
But the case law dictates that you should put the right accident fund in a position to assess your claim. If you're claiming for 50,000 rand general damages or loss, at least that must be there. The paper trail must be there. So now the fund, what they do of late, and I'm sure we will we will get to this, is the um, the directives that uh, Mr. Letzwaller had brought out for the additional information. Mm-hmm. So um, if if I've lodged the claim 60 days has passed, the fund hasn't objected to the claim. Now we in the next 60 days, which mm-hmm. they have, in which to um, further assess the matter if they couldn't get to it in the first 60 days. Obviously, they cannot object to the validity of the claim again, but I just wanted to to take the opportunity to correct a misconception about the first 60 days. Okay. The fact that you lodge a claim uh, and the fund doesn't object to the claim, doesn't automatically make it a valid claim after 60 days. Okay. You still need to comply with certain requirements in order to, to ensure that it's a valid claim. So if you, for instance, a foreigner and you lodge a claim and it doesn't comply, the fact that 60 days has lapsed doesn't mean that it's a valid claim. Mm. Um, the section 24.5 that Mr. Letswalu referred to in his interview doesn't magically make it a valid claim. You still need, you can't make an, a, a stillborn claim live through mm. Section 24.5 because it, it wasn't a claim to start off with. Mm. So we just need to put that into perspective. So now you're in the next 60 days and then 120 days come. So the Road Accident Fund Act again strikes a balance between the rights of the Road Accident Fund and the victim. So the, the act allows the victim or the road accident fund 120 days to assess the claim, make a decision on the matter. If you weren't happy with the, the documents that were submitted to you, you can request a lawyer to, to add on to that before the 120 days so that you can comply before he summons us. Once 120 days have come, the lawyer can summons the road accident fund to compel them to make an offer. Mm-hmm. Now, in a perfect world, you would have found that the road accident fund makes you an offer within 120 days. Just as a matter of interest, when I was working at the fund, we were about three departments of identified claims. And uh, any on any given matter, any one of the claims handlers had about 750 files under that direction sure. that you needed to deal with. If you received a single summons on a matter, you were called into not your senior, your manager's office to go and explain why you received the summons on that matter and you needed you needed to give attention and sort the matter out. We all had mandates, we could all make offers, and nine times out of ten we settled the matters even before 120 days. Times haven't changed, the quality of the claims haven't changed, the basics of the claims are still the same. So you can make an offer within 120 days, even on very little information. You can put the lawyer at risk to say, listen, I give you a certificate for future medical expenses. Because it, more often than not, that's probably the only thing that the lawyer or the claimant will uh, will qualify for. So you put them at risk and you take the 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 um, the the sting out of the claim within the 120 days. But the fund doesn't in more often than not, we don't receive offers. We we have to summons and then we into the court process. So now we have to negotiate that. Uh, platform. So me and you know the uh, High Court rules and the Act is what it is, but of late we as lawyers have been uh, subjected to what we call directives. So what we found is once the Road Accident Fund decided to dissolve the panel of attorneys, the court started just actually just before to implement directives. Now what that means is yes, we've got an Act, we've got rules, but we're going to put a further requirement built into this before you can get to a court on specifically road accident fund matters. So, and those directives are changed every six months. So what happens is I go through the process of applying for a trial date and just before that matter is trial ready and a a matter can be allocated, the directive is changed again retrospectively. So I have to start anew. Okay. So then we already, having regard to the 120 days, we're on four months and then we have to go through this court process that took about a year or two to get to a trial date. Now, with these directives, the court rolls are now in 2029. So if I apply for a trial date today on behalf of one of my clients, the earliest possible date is 2029. So 
what this means for the road accident fund in terms of a cost saving issue is at any single time or given time, the road accident fund can make you an offer. Mm. They don't have to wait for a trial date. They can make you an offer at any time because in that time, the attorneys have to prepare those claims. You can't apply for a trial date before the matter is trial ready. In other words, that claim is done. Everything, all your medical reports are on it. You can take it today. You can settle with the claims. And it doesn't need a court. doesn't no. need a court. Mm. So what the fund does, they sit back, they wait for a trial date. So they kick it down the road. So now we have to go through this process of, of securing a trial date. But now you must remember, those reports that are costing me 150,000 rand mm. are stale after three years. So I have to do it again. So if I was Mr. Litzwalu, I would, and I was intent on saving costs, I would seriously consider engaging the stakeholders and say, listen, guys, this is not working for us because this essentially means I have to do everything twice. Mm -hmm. In even today, three times, because that's how long it takes to secure a trial date. So now, Again, the road accident fund at any given time because these matters are already trial ready. They've got their first set of reports. I've got an actuarial calculation. They've got all the information is available on case lines for them to engage. Nothing happens. So I've got, personally, I've got a serious issue with the argument that lawyers are prolonging the process. I can honestly say eight times out of 10, there's no offers made by the road accident fund before trial date. So even if I secure a trial date today for 2029, let's say for the 24th of March, I will only, the fund will only start working on that matter on the 22nd of March, 2029. Wow. Yeah. That's the first time you'll hear from them. Except if Mr. Letzwalu at that point in time, there was, there were a noises made of a settlement hub, which mm. would, would have been ideal before the disillusion or the uh, not to reappoint the panel mm. was not necessarily uh, in in uh, you because the ma the matters were settled. Ninety percent of them were settled before the matters went to court. But why were they settled? Because there were lawyers involved on behalf of the road accident fund, which could negotiate those settlements. These days, the road accident fund is are not represented, so we have to go to court, get default judgments by the bucket loads because the funds not defending these matters. So you get matters settled for probably a bit more than what we would have found if there was a bit of a pushback mm. from the road accident fund. So I don't know from a cost-saving point of view if they whether it makes cost. does it make sense to take yeah. away. It's like sending a soccer your soccer team in a World Cup final onto the field mm. and you decide not to play with your goalkeeper. It's just take him out. So listen, we're <laughs> going to take that chance. You, you're, you're referring uh, to them removing the panel. And, and the way he presented it gave the impression that these guys were just there to make a lot of money from us. We had to remove them. Using your analogy, the yeah. goalkeeper was here to just make a lot of money from us. We had to remove him. Look, so you, you're saying that that was clearly not, not the best decision. No, look, I mean, obviously they had a contract with these lawyers. And obviously if, if I've got somebody working for me, I have an oversight on, on what they are doing. I mean, when I worked at the fund, I can remember... A, a, a situation where one of our attorneys at the time settled the matter and we didn't give him an instruction to do mm. that. And he, I was still a clerk in the fund at that point in time. Mm. And they, he was called in, that lawyer, and he had to come and stand and explain mm. what he did. So if the fund had a problem with these lawyers or the way that they were conducting themselves, why didn't you call them in and do something about it? Did yeah. you, you've got a contract protecting you. I mean, you the boss. You could manage these guys. And many of them were very good in what they've done. Obviously, like with plaintiff attorneys, I mean, you get different standards of practitioners and they all conduct matters in their own uh, special way. Mm -hmm. But they were there for a reason and, and um, many of them saved the fund a lot of money. And um, I can understand the approach because Professor Klopper made mention of that. But a big reason why those matters were being capable of being settled is because of the, all the hard work that those lawyers had done at the time. Mm -hmm. So a better approach would have probably been to say, listen, let's run down the matters that are in the system with the assistance Finish of these lawyers yep. yeah. and, and, and prevent the frustration on the courts. And in that process, you start developing a settlement hub because you could have engaged any one of those lawyers on those panels and, 
and uh, appointed them in-house mm. as settlement lawyers. And you could have settled these claims hundreds a month as opposed to waiting for the fund to allocate to trial date. But the fact of the matter is it's a cash flow management tool because the longer you can pro pro prolong a settlement of the matter, the more money the fund saves at the end of the day. And with what we found in a few years ago, you had 150 matters on the, on, on the core date every day of which 80% were road accident fund. Hmm. These days we're talking about 30. So you can imagine how many uh, lawyers having to all taxi to get a position on that trial road. And so yeah. the fund's liability is just being spread into, over, a longer, over a longer period of time. And so you're who, saying there's someone who's in an accident today who's likely to only get their matter attended to many, many years from now. Exactly. And this is not, not, this is not as a result of, of the, the legal system. It's a result of, of road accident fund. No, I mean, it, again, I, I think if, if, the, if um, there's a meeting of minds and, the, and we could rather work together, rather, you know, uh, trying to grind each other into the ground. You know, I, like, for instance, this um, directive that Mr. Litzwal has brought out in terms of, of requirements for lodgements of claims, um, to subject lawyers... To, to comply with that, as opposed to the Road Accident Fund Act itself, he could have just asked for it. Mm -hmm. And the lawyers would have probably, because we want to have these matters settled and get out of the, and obviously get results for our clients. We have to remember it's about the client at the end of the day. That's you know, we can fight and we can quibble about, you know, legal terms and semantics. But at the end of the day, that file represents a life. And probably the last paycheck of many of those people. So his perspective is that it represents money for lawyers. Well, David, that's the reality of the matter is you get corporate attorneys that charge a fee. Nobody ridicules them because we don't, you know, I don't deal in that field of law, mm. but they also charge their clients a professional fee. Why aren't personal injury lawyers allowed to charge a fee, which is subjected to the Contingency Fees Act, which has so much judicial oversight. I mean, can't, you, you can't just do what you, you want. You, you have to operate exactly like the Road Accident Fund mm. Act. You can't do anything outside. There's no gray area. Mm. So you either comply or you're going to be at fault and somebody's going to take you to book. As easy as that. So the fact that there are so many lawyers involved in the system, of, you know, unfortunately, because of all the volumes of, of matters that we have to deal with, there's a demand created by, unfortunately, government. By, by, and because, by, by accidents on the road. Exactly, yes. because, you know, the duty of government to some extent to make sure that, um, you know, uh, people making use of, of roads are in a safer environment, policing, you know, happens and people get to a point that you actually start respecting you know, the people in those positions and adhere to the rules of court and sanctions are built in. Then we're going to see it. That's actually the main problem of the fund. The financial liability of the fund is never going to decrease if the amount of accidents aren't addressed properly. I hear we are the third most dangerous roads in the world. Exactly. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what are some of the interesting statistics that 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 you you may you may have in this regard? Because there's some that that were mentioned by 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 the prof. Professor Klopp. Yes. Well, let's look at it this way. The average claimant, for an example, mm. is your is your layman, mm -hmm. your illiterate. Uh, uh, that is not. Uh, it's not your high income earner. That's your average claimant, mm -hmm. and the. The average amount for a claim is 150,000 rand. So uh, it's seldom that you get someone that is going to claim millions and millions. Those are, uh, you know, fewer and far apart. Are you saying those I blew it cases are few? Yeah, they're very, very few. Yeah, the ones that appear on TV with of people course. who got 4 million rands. Yeah, there's very few of those. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, the, the issue here, David, is that the our roads are just not safe as a result of which there's just too many accidents and there's lawlessness on the road. There's just poor policy. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it's then, it's giving the RAF a lot of problems that it's, it currently has. Mm. Uh, the, the clocked court rolls, for an example, are, the, the court rolls are clocked with RAF matters. As, as the prof has said, which then get settled before they get to court. 
And the one thing that we're not talking about is that because of the blocked court roles, if you have an argument with, say, um, uh, your neighbor in a civil matter, mm -hmm. you'll find it very difficult to put your matter on the court roll because the court roles are blocked because of RA matters. Yes. yes. If, say, for an example, uh, you, you owe, Mercedes, you owe uh, West Bank, uh, you have not been paid for your car, West Bank will find it very difficult to put the matter on the court roll to repossess my to repossess car. your car because the court rolls are blocked. So the the ripple effect thereof is that uh, many other matters that should have been handled in the courts are not being handled because the rolls are blocked thanks to the courts. So you're saying that the real focus, whether that focus comes from road accident fund, I'm not sure it's their mandate, or it's the Department of Transport, a lot more work should be happening on the roads before accidents even happen. Pro, Prof. Klopper Prof. has done a research that says uh, if you focus more on accident, on, on reducing the amount of accidents, we can actually reduce the workload that the RF is dealing with. You may even reduce the fuel levy. And you can appoint more safety um, traffic, traffic cops with that money yeah. that goes I, to the accidents. I can quote from the Road Accident Fund's annual report. They're saying the cost that the RAF incurs are as a result of road accidents. The volume and severity of accidents influence the volume and average value of claims mm. made against the Road Accident Fund. Road crashes have adverse implications for economic growth as they affect active members of our society economically as well as those that are not. It even so, gives a, an economic effect on, on the overall picture. Exactly. So, you know, and again, I think the focus should be of the department to focus on addressing the issue of road accident. Yeah. Because by default, the road accident fund would financially be in a better position because obviously the reduction in road crashes would amount to a, a, a reduction in their liability. It's, a, it's such an obvious uh, uh, domino effect. Yeah. Where when you reduce the number of accidents, you reduce the number of cases in court. Exactly. Which makes the court function way better. True. Yeah. Uh, you also in, uh, reduce the number of, the amount of money that needs to be paid to claimants. Yeah. Uh, you also reduce the number of... Uh, uh, of the levy, the amount of the levy that, that us as drivers are paying, because yeah. uh, that has increased over the years. Am I correct? Yeah, one yes, of the things is. that we have done as APRA was to rigorously start the, you know, the campaign to on road safety. Mm. Uh, and we have been doing it through and through. We're still doing it today. We go to schools. Uh, we came up with a concept called Rav Buddy. Mm -hmm. That focuses on road safety. We're focusing on the on the young kids to make sure that... Is it that buddy you have? The yeah. buddy that we have. Oh, yeah. That uh, little... So okay, we, we've put is. a lot of emphasis on that. to make That's the buddy. <laughs> yeah, to make sure that uh, we educate young people. It has like RAF right at the back. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story to that, David. Um... <laughs> Sorry, we disrupted your flow there. <laughs> so this is one of the concepts that we came up with as part of the solutions that we are offering to the fraternity to say, uh, uh, let's go out there and save our people from from getting into accidents. We go to schools. Uh, we're in uh, in the Western Cape last week mm -hmm. when you and me were we started we starting to talk about this, mm -hmm. promoting road safety. Uh, and we we have always been saying that we will to partner with government to uh, to make sure that we because we've got. We've got uh, we've got material that we produce mm -hmm. on road safety. We're dishing it out to, to to schools. We're dishing out to members of the community. On the on the Easter weekend, uh, we camped at the Al Zoo on the N4 mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that people that are that are transiting through the N4 into Pumalang or Mozambique that or busy Kugene, weekend. Mm -hmm. that busy weekend yeah. mm -hmm. to say these are the leaflets that they've prepared. Uh, when you cross the roads, uh, check left, check right, take three seconds to check. Uh, that That's part of the work that we have been doing as APRAF mm -hmm. over a period of time. So we're not just uh, there to defend lawyers as some people are alleging. As a matter of fact, road safety is a big element of what we're doing. Something that I've observed and with the numbers, with road accident uh, numbers, it's always... The highest number of people involved is pedestrians, not exactly, uh, not not cars colliding. That's so part of the stat I wanted to give you. Yeah, uh, your it's it's mainly pedestrians that are getting injured. Mm. 
uh, that big that formed the biggest chunk of claimants. Of the claims. Yes. Yeah. Sure. It's, and and it's which is a very important point, David. Again, I'm going to refer, keep on referring back to the amendment bill. Mm. If we look at who do we address in terms of and protect again, you know, in terms of this act, mm. as you rightfully said, most of the victims are uh, pedestrians. pedestrians. Yeah. So, in terms of the amendment or proposed amendment bill, uh, pedestrians crossing freeways. Uh, accidents on rural areas and certain uh, hit and run matters mm. are excluded from liability or the mm. fund, right accident fund in the future will be excluded from liability. So uh, obviously the concern is if if the road accident fund mm. uh, has historically been labeling themselves mm. as the caring arm of government, why would you exclude the biggest portion of the people that would that have are claiming, to, that yeah. would need that service to be done. So obviously, those are issues that we will address once it gets to Parliament, because I can simply not see why they would statistically exclude those people mm. from uh, cover in terms of the new um, bill that they're proposing. So um, you know, in terms of who, who are being protected or not. In terms of the current Road Accident Fund Act, obviously everybody is, is, is protected in the same way. It doesn't matter how much you earn or what mm. you don't earn. Mm. You've got the same rights as the next person to put former, you know, uh, forward your best possible claim. Let's go to another. Let's the longer it takes, the more money they make. There you go. Yeah. Which money? That We're talking about the 25% yeah, yeah. The no, yes. running costs. Let's, let's, let's talk about some. Right? Mm -hmm. If they can't let's, issue, let's, let's, let's hear him out. They, make, they need to issue someone so that they can start billing. Yeah. And let me tell you what they do. They drip feed us. So Mashavela gives them everything. Mm. Maybe there are 10 requirements. You give them the requirements. You arrive in front of them. You say, here are the requirements. Please go and claim from the road accident fund. Mm. They give us only two things and they leave eight. Yet they have them. They have them. <laughs> you know what happens? Every time we write to them, they say we write an email from the road accident fund, then they bill. Then they phone. We phone them. They say received a call from road accident fund. They bill. Bill. Uh, you call them as much as well. Hey, well, how far? Up. Receiving a call? Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it is a funny, you know, tale of the story. So what is your reaction to this multiple billing? You've answered it in a lot of ways, but you can react directly to what he just said. Yeah, I think the important thing to remember is that obviously lawyers, um, uh, you know, bill for time spent on any particular matter. So, mm -hmm. And you would find that in any uh, uh, professional engagement with a doctor, even a plumber. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to charge you for whatever they do just to pick up their pen or to, to start the car, whatever. They're going to charge you for that. So it's no different from any other profession. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is we've addressed the prolonging of the matter. I think any uh, a personal injury lawyer would be more than thankful if the right accident fund would actually start engaging us earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even once, uh, obviously, as Mr. Letzwala has indicated, we summons, but we summons not just to start, uh, you know, on a cost mission. Mm -hmm. It's to interrupt prescription as well, because we might, must be mindful of the fact that you can lodge a claim within three years, but in terms of the Right Accident Fund Act, if you don't summons within five, the matter prescribes in any event. Mm -hmm. So you have to protect your clients and your own interests by summonsing. And again, the road accident fund at that point can still make an offer. And the list that Mr. Litswalu is referring to is there are certain matters that you are capable of submitting to the road accident fund before that time has lapsed. And again, if you've got people that addresses the matter correctly, you can put it on record and say, listen, I've asked you this before the 120 days. If you still proceed and prolong the matter, on an issue that I would have been able to delve with if you given to me, you could make out a cost argument and say, listen, I've asked for them for this six months ago. Mm. If they had given it to me, I would have saved this costs. So there are ways and means to deal with this. And again, it brings me back to the fact that you need, at least need somebody to look after your own affairs that can stand in your stead and address these kind of shortfalls to prevent things from, um, you know, running 
a full course because there are ways and means that you can actually reduce the time. Let's let's go to we have three or so more. If you look at all civil matters mm. on a civil trial roll every day, eighty-eight mm. percent of them are road accident fund matters. Sure, I didn't realize it was that it's high. What you and let me tell you what then happens. In most of those instances, people just go there to say, hey, we are settling just on the doorstep of the court. After all these funny things that has happened for four years, when you have got a trial date, then the trial date sits there on the day of trial, mm. then the matter is settled. Who in this case settles? It's the, the magistrate says. Bo both of us at that point. They never, 99% of them never even go in front of a magistrate. When they go there, they are supposed to be just made a court order. Sure. It is after all this funny going up and down, which creates money for the lawyer. <laughs> David, <laughs> we've, we've addressed that, it. <laughs> that funny up and down means the claim is ready to settle. So mm. I'm, I'm informed by the registrar of the court today. Your matter has secured a trial date for the 24th of March, 2029. Yeah. That means I'm done. I've done yeah. everything that I could. The fund now has five years to make me an offer based upon all the documents. They can, they can do it today. They can do yeah. it now. But they don't because they'll make you an offer in 2029. Mm. So it's not, with all due respect, the lawyers that are prolonging this process. How these directives work that we're subjected to is you can't secure a trial date if you can't prove that your matter is trial ready. That means... The mat is done. Mm. It's prepared. It's packaged. It's got a red bow on it. You give it to the fund. They can assess it, make an offer now. We spoke about capacity. And then you're likely to answer the same way. Why don't they do that? Are they, what is their reason for delaying the settlement? If based on 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 the two heads you've you've worn one yeah. you've been there before yeah. Yeah. and now you're you're seeing it from a different perspective, David. If we're looking at this, the only reason why I can imagine this is for them to save costs. And but by what the costs same, are they saving in this case? Because they don't have to address these hundreds and thousands of matters immediately. They can kick it down the road for five years. But that, you're not saving it. You're postponing. Exactly. The, you're just the prolonging the pain. Yes. So by the same token, Mr. Litswala is saying we're trying to make a lot more money. They're trying to save a lot more money. So mm -hmm. why don't the, we try and merge these two and meet each other in between and settle the matters? Because mm -hmm. there's no reason why... I'm not going to, as a lawyer, I won't be able to charge my client much for the next five years because the work's already been done. You no. can charge for a phone call. Your client is going to update. They might take you to the LPC because they can't understand that the matter is taking so long. Mm. But, the, you know, if you tell them, listen, but the matter is, the fund can make an offer at any time. They can do that at any time. It's not for me to take the fund by the hand and say, listen, guys, please attend to this. And as you say, in terms of, manpower i think honestly speaking the road accident fund is totally under resourced in terms of um people qualified with all due respect to assess these matters i know mr Litzwala is saying it's just completion of forms these matters uh, as a ripple effect in terms of complexity and after 2008, these claims are much more complex than just simple whiplash matters. You need to have a seasoned lawyer. When we were at the fund, working at the fund, you the, the requirement was that you had to have a legal degree to start mm -hmm. off with. I've looked at the annual report of the Road Accident Fund. Did they know we're in this report? Does it even give an inkling that you need to have a legal background to be able to be a claims handler at the Road Accident Fund? If we accept that this whole act is an adversarial uh, chess game. <clears throat> now you put a person that doesn't have a legal degree toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with a lawyer that's got 25 years experience <clears throat> in this. What do you think is going to happen? Sure. So I would say reassess and take the resources that you're wasting on litigation that doesn't have any hope of, of success <clears throat> because you've been... Uh, shown the door more than once on the same issue. Take that money, invest it in proper internal legal counsel that can address this. Take matters that are trial ready now, five years in advance, and settle them.
get a settlement up, up and running. There were talks of that just before COVID. We actually had a conversation with Mr. Letswalu uh, in which there were talks that the Road Accident Fund would be moving towards that. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened. So there are enough qualified people out there. You can you can think about all of these lawyers that lost their the jobs panel? that were on the panel, mm. that were very good at what they and did. And they, they understand they already understand that space exactly. quite well. Yeah. So you can take one of them to address 10, 20 matters a day because mm. they know they take files, they that takes them a quarter of the time that it would take an, a person that doesn't have a legal background. Mm. To, to address this. So I really think that the, and the, what we've said as APREF, there are simpler ways of saving the fund, um, the vi financial viability, and obviously in terms of um, service delivery, you know, to actually be what they want to be at the end of the day, but it's going to take a, a matter of taking hands and working together mm. rather than this, you know, keeping up this adversarial front. Yeah, we see it in the newspapers. <laughs> Are you saying this, this, this process is then, it's created? Absolutely. For no other we, reason. We've spoken about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's not interested in settling this thing because he's going to make money of it. <laughs> so the longer it takes, the, the better. longer it takes yeah, for we him. Got this. <laughs> we got this. The longer it takes. Remember, this is not defined benefits. Mm. So for your pinky, we don't know course, how much, how much that must costs. Do the calculation. Yes, yes, Yours yes. is different from mine because when now you use your hands to, to do DJ, whatever you to control, did, this. Yeah, to control that and <laughs> yes, all that. So yes. I'm a pianist. A, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So it will always be different. Of course. So, but remember, they are billing us 10,000 per calculation when they are billing others much, much less. Okay, so who are others in this context? No, I mean uh, law firm, uh, and again, no, but insurance, old mutual, whatever, yeah. everyone, yeah, you know. So they all. So we're not Of course, now it's worse with hospitals, doctors. They charge us five times what they charge a medical aid, and you have proof of this. Absolutely, it's there. That's why we brought in these things like your minimum requirements, where we are saying. For you to, for us to be able to accept your claim, at least give us the minimum requirements. Because you see, how do I make an offer to you, Mashavela, when mm. I don't know, uh, you, I don't know your food particulars of claim. True. So I'm, I'm sitting here. You say I had a head injury. I say, well, fine, you had a head injury. How does it impact your and life? What is the damage and what is the loss? Mm. And then you don't give me all that information. I don't even know. Sometimes they don't even give us the actual um, uh, accident report for which is, gives the nexus between your injuries and wow. the fact that you must go to rough. Because you could have fallen off from a rooftop, for instance. Mm. Yes, the injury might come in from that. We are saying to them, give us that. And no, 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 no. When we do that, it's wrong. A road accident fund must not ask for those things. What is your reaction? Uh, he's, he's saying lawyers don't don't comply in a lot of, in a lot of matters. <laughs> well, let me respond to the first part where he said... Uh, um, you know, it made a difference between injuries. Mm. Uh, and uh, because, you see, RAF pays for specific injuries, right? And that then goes to show that uh, he can't then equate the RAF with the with SASA because, like I said before, no two injuries are the same. Mm. And no, no two accidents are the no same. No two accidents are, are the same, uh, as a result of which the injuries will differ. It, it therefore then can equate it to to the RAF, uh, uh, like I, you know, I, I would want to be seen to be responding to the exact things that he has said because some of them are just uh, distasteful. <laughs> well, that's the whole point of coming in is to address the distasteful <laughs> bits. Can, can I address the board notice issue? What he's actually um, referring to is what the the Road Accident Fund Act, as I said, is prescriptive in what what its requirements are in terms mm -hmm. of section 24 it's pretty clear you have to in order to validly lodge a claim you need to have an RAF1 with a medical report and that's it mm. so what Mr. Letswalo had done is he was probably sitting in his office or at a board meeting and they decided no that's not enough we've got this idea to settle claims within 120 days which is a good idea mm. I mean if you can make it work so let's bring out a board notice and then we require lawyers to lodge claims 
with these additional documentation. And we decide that if you don't comply with that, we're not going to take your matter. So what has happened now, what we've experienced is now we lodge claims that substantially comply with the Act, which are fine. And what the fund, we lodge them via a registered post as we allowed in terms of the Act. So what the fund then does is they put those matters in a um, bag and they send it back to us. They don't acknowledge receipt of them. They don't have any record of receiving those claims. They just send it back to us Why because do it do doesn't that? because it doesn't comply with the board notice. Okay. So now the in reality, what is happening now is so I've on my records, I've got a registered slip showing that I've lodged this claim. So I'm sitting out the 60 days, nothing's happening because obviously the fund doesn't have the file. Because they send it back. Yes, it's it's in. Yeah. So now, now 120 days has come. So now I summons because there's still nothing on it. So now I summons and the fund is scurrying around looking for this claim which they've sent back, which they don't even know. Mm-hmm. So it's still coming. So, I mean, what, what in reality is happening here is Mr. Letswalu is blaming the lawyers for not complying with a board notice that doesn't. Uh, isn't worth the paper it's written on. If you wanted to have those additional documents made a requirement for lodging a claim validly, Mm -hmm. you had to go through the process of amending the Act Mm -hmm. to make provision for that. You can't through a board notice. Well, in fact, he or his board doesn't have the authority to bring out the board notice, and they've been showed this by the court. They've been told, listen, you can't do this allow those claims to be lodged, and he still doesn't do it. He still requires us to file these claims based upon this board notice. So what's happening now is the the annual report is going to be skew in terms of the amount of matters that are lodged because in my practice, I might have lodged 20 matters a month and he doesn't have any record of that because he keeps on sending them back because it doesn't comply with these board notices that he's brought out. So, But, what what, is, but why doesn't it comply if the... the for it to comply doesn't seem complicated. Now, what 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 they're trying to do, which I can understand, is that they want to have the, a complete claim. For instance, they would require the lawyers to have the medical legal reports done. And most problematic of all, the RAF4, which is a serious uh, injury assessment report. Now, the problem with the RAF4 is you can't have the RAF4 done before uh, uh, a full recovery has been made by the victim. Mm. And for instance, in brain injured matters, that might take two or three years. So you you can, in fact, not comply with that requirement. Mm. And in fact, it's not a requirement in terms of the act simply for that reason. Yeah. So you can't expect the claimant to lodge an RAF4 if by lodging it itself, you're already contravening the act because mm-hmm. the act says you can't do it before for your, uh, your complete medical yeah. recovery has taken place mm-hmm. so it's a and contradiction it's part, of, it's part of the requirement it's part of the requirement so now they also require you to submit for instance an accident report which is a logical thing but now you were a passenger in a taxi with 10 people uh, you stay in Bochum yeah the accident took place in um, um, Paris in the free state mm-hmm. You don't have the resources to, to get that accident report. And more often than not, the your name wouldn't appear on that accident report. So it's of no consequence. Mm. So they can't deny liability on the claim because you didn't submit an accident report because it's a requirement in terms of the act. We do that as a rule. We try and do that because it makes the work of the fund lighter. But in certain circumstances, you cannot comply People that don't work or don't have contact can't submit IRP5. So now you submit or require a layman to submit an RAP, you know, a RP5, and he can't do that. And now you say, no, it doesn't comply, just send it back. So the problem is then the time frame keeps on running. So mm-hmm. you're running the risk of prescription. So so that is where this thing comes in, is because yeah. of this, let's call it ignorance of the road accident fund the victims are being put on risk that the matters might prescribe due to a, a board notice that is, that is simply doesn't have any legal standing um, in terms of any requirements. By the same token, Mr. Letswalu could have sent a circular to all of the plaintiff attorneys or stakeholders and say, listen, guys, going forward, 
Let's see whether we can make this work and submit this with your claims. And I can promise you, David, most of them would have complied because we're all in this to try and work to a singular purpose is to get these matters finalized as soon as we can. And, and as opposed to what Mr. Letzwalo is saying. So he is, let's call it pipe dream of 120 days, simply not attainable because if we just argue the RA4 point, you can't, it won't, it will never happen. But you can get close to that. Some matters like loss of support claims, yes, can do that. That's a different category of a claim. There's no personal circumstances that can change necessarily in terms of what a per person's recovery of her accident is. Those matters, yes. So there are certain classes of claims that I would say, yes, it can happen. But then let's just do it the right way. So this is what you do. You don't make it a requirement before you can you can assess the claim once it's lodged and say and send him a letter a week after and say, listen, please send me the following. Because that would enable while, me while we've accepted it, yes. said we are missing these following. Exactly. Not just send it back and it's yeah. out of the system. Yeah. Exactly. I've I've heard Mr. Litswalu using the term it's a silly clause mm. in the act to require the fund to comply within sixty days and if you're not it's a valid claim. It's not. There's case law that says that the fact that you lodged a claim doesn't necessarily make it a valid claim. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's many case law. There's there's appellate court decisions on that point. So the fact of the matter is, if the administration of the fund mm -hmm. is up to standard and what it should be, like we did many years ago, you will have the opportunity within the first sixty days to assess a claim and get everything that you need reasonably could require. Mm -hmm in onto your file to at least make an initial offer of settlement and say, listen, based upon this, I can see your client has orthopedic injuries, probabilities there that they would require future medical expenses. There's a certificate. So you take the sting out of the future medical expenses part of that. Sometimes a practitioner is not able to prove the rest of that because it might be a pensioner. Mm. So that's all that he can claim is a certificate. Then the claim is done. If their lawyer then goes and prolongs the matter, then the fund can argue, listen, I've made you this offer two years ago. Mm. We're not paying for this. And that's how it works. If you put the lawyer on risk and you make an offer early enough in the process, you put him on risk. If you make him a good enough offer, and if he can't show two years down the line that he beat that offer, the fund's not liable for the cost from mm -hmm. that date from that moment. to the date that yeah. the matter is actually settled. So I think they should dial in to the act itself because all this all the sanctions are in there all the remedies are in there to protect the victim and the fund by equal terms let's listen to it's probably the last we are one. told by uh, our learned judges that uh, any person in terms of the rough act means even illegal foreigners mm -hmm. hey i know you've been having that battle very recently you're in and out of court because now we'll, we'll we'll get to that but you see for, for me we start there where we say this 10 billion must actually go to the claimant. Mm -hmm. Our aim is to say 40% out of every rent, 40 cents mm -hmm. or more was going to administrative costs. Mm -hmm. And it's like Mashavera going to buy a medical aid and much more of the money goes to the administrator. Than it does to the doctor. Than it, than it buys you. The medical care. The medical care. And we are saying, which fund works on those principles? Because the lower the administrative cost, the better. And we are saying, there is no need to litigate. Because if 99% of the time when we arrive in court, we actually settle these claims, why litigate? Reaction? I agree. Mm. But then you must do your part in the process as well. Because obviously the first, the initial part of the claim, lodging the claim, getting to 120 days, it's cast in stone. It is what it is. Lawyers were always summoned. Mm -hmm. But you as the defendant or the right accident fund in this instance have the opportunity to address that. You don't have to go further than 120 mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. If you did your homework and you assess that this matter is the nature of the injuries are the following, you want the... the, the um, the, the information based upon the injuries of the client to be able to assess your claim and make an offer, make your need known. Put it in writing, get it on record, because everything that you do is obviously aimed at the end of the day to either go into a cost argument or to save costs. Mm. So mm. the fund 
has the opportunity to address this and curb the costs by just attending to these matters, by applying their minds and getting people again involved. Look, the Road Accident Fund has wonderful people working there. And I mean, I think they overextended as they are. And, um, but they need a lot more. There's a lot more that's required. And, and, you know, because the sheer volumes of matters that, that they would have to deal with, obviously, they will have to do an assessment and see how best they can address this. But just to kick it down the road and blaming the lawyers for postponing the matters is simply not going to cut it. I mean, it's and, and, and I just want to maybe quote David on the first instance of foreigner claims because mm. I... It seems that Mr. Litzwala is going to to um, appeal this again. Obviously, this has been heard more than once in courts. And and the most recent matter, the judge said, where the le- legislator, we must remember in 2008, the act was changed to accommodate or to exclude certain classes of claimants. So when, that, when those changes, those were the last uh, big changes that were made, it is said there where the legislator intended to exclude certain victims from claiming against a, a road accident fund. It explicitly did so in Section 212B with victims who suffered an emotional shock as a result of the driving of a vehicle. The RAF Act does not contain an explicit exclusion where the victim is an illegal foreigner, um, as it does with these victims. So again, it's a creature of statute. You can't argue it. You can go to court... A hundred times, she's still going to get the same result. You need to change the act to make provisions. So the us. real work is is vying, changing the act, vying parliament. And they've done <laughs> that with the proposals in the in the new uh, mm-hmm. um, act. They've they've made provision for that. Whether they're going to succeed, like with any of the other amendments, we'll have to see. Time will tell. Yeah. But for now, unfortunately, you will have to bite the bullet and pay these people. Here's an issue that. Uh, a, keeps coming up really with direct claim what are, what are you saying to mr letzualo with regards to this direct claim because you guys keep appearing in newspapers not liking each other on this <laughs> what are you saying to him exactly about this direct claim are you saying to him close it down it's a bad idea because he's spending a lot of money on this he's spending mm. a lot of money on call centers and all of that yeah. what are you saying to him really about this direct claim? look i mean he we must give credit where it's due. When 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 Collins came in, uh, most of the provincial hospitals had a little office where uh, you could lodge an RAF matter there okay. in every hospital all over the country. The difficulty with that is that anybody who's got, who's got an injury could go there and lodge it mm. uh, directly with the fund. Now you would find that. Even those small injuries would not otherwise be valid claims are then locked into the system of the RAF. Okay, they over overcrowd the Ex- system. Exactly. Yeah. Then then the RAF has got to see through a lot of claims that are not valid claims or that shouldn't even be there. Mm-hmm. Now, credit to Mr. Lezualo when he came in because he realized, and I must say through our advice, that uh, the hospitals are giving him claims that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Then it closed all uh, all offices in the in the hospitals. Okay. The difficulty with that is that anybody could go in and say, "I've lost a claim," mm. and you know what happens when you when you are injured, be it uh, valid or not. When you're injured, you say, "No, no I've lost a claim uh, with the RAF. I'm waiting for them to compensate me. I'm waiting for money from the RAF." Mm-hmm. And then it takes uh, two, three years before you could hear from them. But then you're sitting and waiting for for your money to come. Mm -hmm. Then how do you feel as a claimant? You feel, oh, the RAF is not looking after me. And then, you know, before your claim could prescribe, you then go to a lawyer and say, I've been waiting for the RAF. We check, oh, no, no. In fact, based on our assessment of your injury, you don't qualify for... And that you find out that three years later. You know? Yeah, Th- that's the other thing. But credit to Collins, he has closed down those those uh, um, those centers in the hospitals for that specific reason. And the the lawyers are there to help him mm. to sift claims that shouldn't have been going to him in the first place. Because mm. if you've got an impairment that that does not amount to thirty percent injury on your body, 
any any lawyer who who knows the way could tell you no no no. I understand you've been injured, but the RAF will not be able to compensate you for this one. Mm. Then the, then the claimant does not have to bother Collins with that. Uh, but without the advice of a lawyer, uh, you know, I could injure my finger and say to it was an accident. Mm. I've been injured. Mm. Uh, here's the accident report. The result of that is that then the 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 RF has, has, has have got a lot of work that they've got to look into, which the others wouldn't have been able mm. to, you know, wouldn't have been required to look at. Simple yeah. question, simple yeah. answer. Should Mr. Litswalo close down this directly? He, he has. He has yeah. closed them. Can yes. I, I can quote from the um, uh, annual report. It says that there's been a flattening of direct claim settlements due to the changing strategic direction to stop the originating of direct claims. So that's definitely something that they have done. The If we're talking about inhumane part of this, what I've encountered personally in, in matters is where you find people that come to you and say, listen, I've engaged the road accident when I was in hospital. Uh, I'm currently in a wheelchair. Somebody from the road accident fund came to me to tell me that they would assist me with the claim. <clears throat> They don't, unfortunately, never got a reference, but they think because it's a road accident fund, it's fine. Mm. So four years down the line, they're still waiting for the road accident fund to come back to them and make an offer because they stay in an area like uh, Nwaku has explained. You don't have resources to get to people. So what we do is obviously we've got a lot of community outreaches where we engage the public and speak to them about the road accident fund and try to empower them with the knowledge of what to do if you ever confronted with a situation. So now we see people that in that era of direct claims that saw fit to engage the fund because it's the caring arm of government just to find four years later that I'm wheelchair bound and there's nothing that I can do with it about it because my claim has lapsed. I can't put in a claim as a lawyer because there's no record of that conversation. It's the client's word against the road accident fund. Now the person that Work in that hospital is no longer there. There's no way that you can mm. prove that that conversation ever happened. And that's the unfortunate thing. There was an expectation that was created throughout the public that we will pay you. You mm. must just come to us. Don't go to lawyers. They're going to steal your money. But but he's doing that a lot more now than any other time the in the history that, of road accident fund. That's the unfortunate thing, David, that I don't understand. It's like a dog chasing its own tail. Mm. You're advertising. I still saw them advertising at Comrades. You're making your, your presence known. So, and he's all, he's actually created a call center for the public to phone and complain about lawyers. Or, or the phrasing is wrong, and I'll correct you. He, he says it's not to complain about lawyers, it's to to check if your claim is, at what stage is your claim. Yeah. So let so, me rephrase you. <laughs> <phrase you. laughs> so so what, what, what essentially happens now that he tells, now the call center tells this person, listen, there's no claim. Mm. What, what is the advice then? Come to us or go and see a lawyer, you know, to do a claim. What, what do they do? They're, they're, well, I, I wouldn't know, but I imagine the advice is there's no claim, but while you're here, you can actually, we can actually take you through the process of claiming. Exactly. You don't need a lawyer. Exactly. So now you bring out a board notice mm. that's nowhere on record. The public doesn't know about it. And this poor good fellow is trying to comply with the act because that's the act. And he goes to the fund two days before his claim lapses. And there's a pre-assessment because that's what the fund now does. They, they using their resources to do that work. And they see, listen, but this guy's claim is substantially compliant, but the board notice is no um, mm -hmm. ARIA. So, sorry, they send them away. Two days later, his claim's prescribed. Hmm. So, I mean, that's, you know, I think, again, you know, the problem with this is that there's too many gray areas here. We need to, to tuck it back to what it is. Mm. Uh, the, the act is crisp. It's clear. Let's everybody play by the same rules and there will be more justice, e equality for everybody involved in this system. Do we have a sense of uh, the stats in relation to those claims that get prescribed? I've got, <laughs> funny that you uh, mentioned that. I've got the executive summary of the road accident fund uh, dated the 15th, uh, it's the 3rd of December 2015. That was when 
direct claims were still huge because mm-hmm. the benefit scheme, they were rolling this out as a test. And um, it says here the background, in the last two years, over 9,000 direct claims were referred to the CEO in order for him to waive a prescription after the claims prescribed in the hands of the RAF. Hmm. 9,000 in two years. Wow. But 9,000 out of how many? uh, Because there has to be the the base number that 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 gives us... They they give all sorts of... uh, Well, you know, they're talking about... You're considering the period from 2020 to 2022, the estimated number of young people who died. You asked me earlier. Mm. Statistics on the road was 13,000 out of 34,000 fatalities. So, I mean, this is, we're talking huge numbers of people. But that's a while ago, isn't it? We talked, you said that, that's yeah. a 2020. This, uh, this 2020 was, no, no, no. You, uh, sorry, this was actually uh, Mr. Latolu yesterday um, talking um, <laughs> safer roads, the end goal. So, what he said, yes, obviously, he cautioned the public, uh, you know, about the amount of fatalities on the road. So, the thing about direct claims is, and the unfortunate thing is, if we accept that most claimants are are, are patients in provincial hospitals, so mm. what the fund at that point had done, they've got, they had offices in those hospitals. So the point of entry was the road accident fund at the time. So let's say, for instance, we're working on 34,000 per year. Most of those people would have been subjected to that direct claim system. Mm -hmm. And most of them would have been told, listen, go directly to the fund because there was a narrative that was created by the road accident fund at the time to talk down attorneys and to, um, you know, obviously make them the boogeyman that you should try and and do this this yourself. Come to us directly. We'll sort this out. And this is what, what the result of that exercise was. Is it doing the same now? Look like of the same same level of of what you're just describing. No, not now? look like Marco said he's withdrawn from the provincial hospitals. But what I see in practice is that you see the road accident fund on the road engaging people. Mm. Obviously, the idea is for some reason to tell people what the status of their matters are. These most of these people are represented, you know, hopefully by this time. So mm. they've got lawyers that they can engage. But I mean, you find people. That might think, you see, I mean, uh, where matter took 55 months about two years ago to, to get to finality, we're talking about 84 months now to take a matter from the taking of instruction to receiving a payment. Just to give you an idea, if I settle a claim today, the earliest that I'm going to get that payment is to, in two years' time. Because, again, the road accident fund went to court and asked for a postponement on payments to prevent attorneys from issuing writs against them. So that essentially meant that all your matters were um, were kicked down the road in terms of payment. So I've got some interesting statistics here just to give you an idea mm. in terms of, of uh, payment frequencies from the fund that we are experiencing at the moment. Um, you know, and these are all people that have represented uh, victims of, of car crashes that has already... Uh, been through the process of securing settlements on behalf of their clients. There's, there were statistics that were run um, from plaintiff attorneys. And the result was that 95.5% of matters are not paid within 180 days from settlement. Hmm. That's, that's all you can accept that it's your matter, gonna... you won't receive payment within two years' time yeah. from, the, from the day of settlement. 86.4 uh, were, they were percent of matters had there's been a slowdown in payments over in the, the past three, three months. months. And mm. 54.5 percent that no capital payments have been received during the last three months. That means that all settlements of the, over the past three months that were made properly with a court order, everything in finalized. Place, three months later, still no payments made on, on them. So um, what what do you, what have you found out as the reason for that? Because everything is sorted. It's just a matter of someone in finance doing their job. <laughs> Mr. Luswalo is on record on that interview stating that the fund has the money. I'm not sure why they're not paying. I don't yeah. know. We can speculate, but um, I'd rather not. But the fact of the matter is, again, it's about the victims. If you are sincerely 
trying to to own up to what your uh, mandate in terms of the road accident fund is to compensate people. That is the first and foremost requirement that you have. And you get to a point that you know, okay, fine, I need to pay these people this. It's been through the process. Pay them. Let me read this. We got a a mail, and and this is almost a consultation. Just bear with me. Uh, Mr. Machavel, I was listening to your podcast with uh, Mr. Letzualo from... uh, Road Extended Fund explaining the important uh, points uh, for us passengers in a taxi going to work uh, from Brie taxi to Bramfontein FMB uh, building corner Pritchard goes on and goes on. We got an accident in Simon Street next um, uh, next to the new building of of the rank. I tried to apply for myself at the Road Accident Fund offices uh, in Parktown next to Castle Clinic. I have all documents. My problem is. Uh, Simon's first, uh, I'm not sure what that is, uh, is Simon's first treatment uh, doctor in Mel Park Medical Reports, which I need to pay 2500 upfront so I can get uh, that an RAF f- uh, Form 4 uh, be filled by a specialist. I need 6000 rands maximum, which I don't have. I'm writing this to you to please assist me I will send attachment and so forth uh, to ref offices. I'm not sure if you understand uh, understood yes, it completely. But w- okay, it's easy. Um, what this person is trying to do is obviously to do a direct claim, mm-hmm. and this is exactly what we're experiencing on a daily basis. So now they go directly to the fund, but what the fund doesn't explain to them is, if you want to lodge a claim, obviously there are certain statutory requirements that you need to comply with. As he has mentioned, they are RAF one, RAF four. Mm-hmm. He mentions there an amount of 2,000 rand that it's he's not able to It's an upfront payment for medical care. Yeah. Yeah. So the public, the, the your general victim doesn't have the money mm-hmm. to even start up the claim. Mm-hmm. So if you, again, it brings me to the initial argument about why lawyers will always form part of the system. You can imagine that if you take lawyers out of the system, this is what you find on a daily basis. If the fund doesn't even attend to him, mm-hmm. How are they going to attend to the thousands of other man, people that's been in exactly the same situation that cannot afford to engage the fund? The people need the lawyers to be able to get over that first step and open the door and engage the road accident fund. It's as simple as that. And that's exactly the plight of this person. This person will never get justice if he doesn't get to a lawyer because a lawyer will assess his matter. He will say, listen, you're a passenger, so your merits are fine. Your injuries need to be the following, then we can assist you and then we can engage you on the basis and then we come to terms in terms of contingency fee Mm -hmm. agreement. You don't have to pay up front, we'll carry the burden and afterwards we will cover expenses as simple as that. I'm going to give you this and this person's email address and who knows, maybe you can do something for them. (laughs) Because we're dealing with someone that's actually had an accident but they're not getting, they don't know, they don't know what, what to do and they seem to think that uh, claiming direct is the only way to go about it. No, it's definitely not the only way, David, but I'll give you feedback. We'll follow up and I'll give you feedback on yeah. this. Yeah, why not? Okay. Maybe we should do this all the time. We should do the regular <laughs> you, you can use this as a shows. test run and, <laughs> and, you can... and see what happens. Yes. Yeah, I think we've, we've touched on a lot of, of, of the issues that uh, uh, based on the videos that we had uh, prepared, but I, I want you guys to, to conclude it. You've watched this, this video. I know uh, you reacted on the spot <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on, on this matter. <laughs> and I remember uh, how it happened is you sent us a mail. And for me, you, you seem like another complaining uh, <laughs> viewer of, of the channel. Yeah, And I started the, the process of looking for someone to, to do this right of reply. Yeah, And in my search, I called a lawyer friend of mine. And he gave me your number. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, this is the same guy yeah. <laughs> that complained. Yeah. So, so in conclusion, what are you saying uh, to to all the all the you know yeah. uh, the things that uh, Mr. Letzualo said? Look, my 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 issue has always been uh, we we are we are not the abrasive type, and uh, I I worry that there would have been a a TikTok 30, 30 minute second, 30 second video video that someone will take from your podcast and that will go out as the as the gospel. I'll tell you what it will go. It'll, it'll yeah. say 
Lawyers, they, they yeah. just take money. They're in it yes. for money. <laughs> oh, no, they fill forms. Yes. And then in those 30 seconds, the, the 30 second TikTok video will be making the rounds. And uh, then that is taken as the gospel. Mm. Uh, but also, that will also speak to the credibility of your podcast to say, oh, oh okay, my is promoting some of these things, mm. the inaccuracies. The initial response was, uh, we actually, our initial response was we need coffee with you just to say, no, 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 something is not right there. Mm. We didn't think it would come to this. The idea was, no, no, let's have coffee or lunch with David and mm. say, no, no, we've picked up from the things that have been said in your podcast that certain things are inaccurate. So let's let's straighten them up. Mm. Now to have been given this opportunity to us was, was first price, to come and say the things that we have said, to to level the playing field, to say, no, no, this is the other side of mm. the truth and there are people that are actually trying to do the right thing by the victim. And uh, we have been tested, we have been tried, uh, we have been around for quite a long time and we'll still be around to try and set the record straight. We actually have been engaging with him on a number of on a number of issues that uh, are bedeviling the fund. In fact, the first few months he started, some of the decisions he has made within the fund are as per our engagement with him and mm. as with, you know, with regard to our advice to him. Mm. So mm. that 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 has been the whole thing to say. Let's level the playing field. Let's conclude it, <laughs> David. From my side, just want to thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the viewers' time to give us the opportunity to just again level the playing field and to to paint the picture of there's two sides to the coin mm. and i think at the end of the day the purpose of this is just to in in the mind of the viewer you know plant the seed and say there is hope the the, the road accident fund system as it is is a wonderful system it's actually one of the government's best social benefit programs that they've developed mm. um and again i think um working together as opposed to on a confrontational basis all the time is is probably the best way to to go we as APREF has a lot has done a lot of research in terms of cost saving matters mm. uh, that wouldn't um you know include major changes um, we accept that changes has to be made i mean times have changed the act is is um uh, has been in is for for quite some time and obviously um you know to bring it up to the current requirements of of the republic and the victims is i mean it's inevitable mm. but i think that the best way forward for the right accident fund is to consider stakeholders and uh, give us the opportunity uh, not necessarily APREF, but you know people that have uh you know a common purpose to to try and save the fund because you know, believe it or not, we as as lawyers uh, also want to see this thing succeed. And you might say, yeah, because you've got financial interest in the matter. But again, there's a victim at the end of this road. And it's not just about filling papers. It's about changing a person's life and to make sure that that form that you fill is essentially that person's last <coughs> uh, paycheck and signature that you can make sure that he has a at least a fair opportunity to compete um, to whatever extent he's still capable of doing that after this unfortunate event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Thank you for hosting us. We Thank appreciate you. it. It's the Association uh, for the Protection of Road Accident Victims. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very appreciate much. appreciate it. Uh, yeah, let's hope it, it benefits some people. Hopefully. Um, yeah. um, that's the purpose of your podcast anyway, and we appreciate the, the good effort that you're doing. King King David Studio Podcast.